Hello everybody, I'm Kostas. I'm going to present a new smart contract called KELT and it's a reactive key loss protection mechanism and we're focusing on the problem where a user is losing their key and they need to find a way somehow to get access back to their account. Um, this is a joint work with my colleagues Irakli, Sam, Tim, Lefteris, Jos, Panos, Rias and David. All of them are very skillful on uh, engineering, cryptography, security and custody. Um, and we focused for a while in a number of uh, challenging key management and custody products and projects. And we realized uh, that we have a very interesting solution that we would like to share with you here uh, about this particular problem. So uh, along with the idea, we're going to explain the current state of the art and how people are doing key management. And we will realize that most of the current solutions are proactive which means that you have to take action before the incident. You have to back up your keys. You have to use some secret sharing probably or some multi-party computations uh, set up or you need to delegate your key in a custodial service. Um, and we will explain, I mean, with a description of our smart contract, how we bypass all of the uh, limitations of previous approaches to be able to provide the reactive solution and then we have a few slides at the very end about features, threads. Uh, we also have some extensions from the original protocols and we will uh, show you how the incentives play a role on our construction. Um, if you stick for a bit in this particular slide, you will realize that we have like three flavors of the same problem. It's someone is losing access to their wallet password or the private key material. Uh, there is no hard disk access anymore. I mean, there is no private key backup and someone else mistyped the civic address, which means that there is a destination address for which nobody knows the associated key. And uh, everyone will think, oh, is this even feasible to find a solution to such a problem? And you will see how uh, we're approaching the problem. But before that, uh, I need to explain what is not a goal for us. And we're not focusing on compromised key material. We said lost key, but not compromised. And eventually when we're saying you mistyped your address, we don't mean that you sent to the wrong, uh, uh, let's say contact, right? It's you just misspelled one character on your address, which means that this new address doesn't have uh, um, an owner. Um, if you search on the web, you will find a ton of examples of people actually lost a huge amount of money. Uh, in this case, someone, actually threw away their hard disk and they are offering 70 million to the Newport City Council in Wales uh, for a permission to dig it up, right? I mean, some device. And they need to excavate in the landfill site and imagine if this device had 7,500 Bitcoins, $70 million is uh, like a small portion of the total value. Um, there is also the case of people sending money to the wrong chain. And uh, this happened actually on the fork of Bitcoin Cash, where the address format was similar to the, to the previous Bitcoin, but the, uh, the, the SegWit address uh, was not constructed in the same way as the Bitcoin Cash address, which means that the same private key could not be used if you send the money there. Um, the other case, of course, is we're forgetting and we're forgetting passwords. And this man, for example, has two guesses to unlock, I mean, a quarter of a million uh, worth uh, Bitcoin. And um, this is a problem in general because uh, today we're using passwords a lot. People are using mnemonics. Some people are not storing them correctly or even if they're storing them on paper, this paper is thrown away, thrown out of the home and nobody has access to this anymore. You forget one or two words and you're done. You don't have access anymore. Um, there are examples of mistyped addresses, especially in Ethereum. I mean, we see an example of 40 Ether uh, sent to the wrong address because of one or two digits being wrong. And, oh, I know Mike. Mike used to be my former manager in my previous place. And if you are familiar with his story, Mike was one of the first uh, developers of Satoshi. And we know many things about his interaction with Satoshi. And we know that Satoshi has sent him like a bunch of uh, Bitcoins. But as Mike said, back then Bitcoin was just an experiment. It, it was just an interesting science project. And eventually he lost the keys. Uh, so there are, we know actually the, the real addresses of Mike uh, that own some significant amount of Bitcoin with obviously with the today's price, uh, but nobody has access to them anymore. 
Uh, notable examples include people who were seized by authorities. Uh, very interesting one is the one that, uh, what if you die, if you pass away, or uh, you're disabled anymore to transfer the, the, the private key knowledge on your family, right? We don't have a good solution as a society now, or what's happening on this. And um, there is another issue that I'm, I'm personally familiar with, um, where there was an updated software uh, on, on a wallet software, and then they had to send um, from the original Bitcoin addresses to SegWit addresses money, I mean, to, to be upgraded. And during this upgrade, there was a bug and the users could never see the mnemonic of the new address. So they were sending the money to the new, their new address, advertised new address, but they didn't have access anymore. Um, so what is happening today? Uh, we have a ton of solutions. There is, there is cold storage. I mean, uh, cold storage is like putting your key in uh, a device, in a medium where this is not in the internet. Uh, not connected, maybe protected uh, by environmental factors or so on. And some things uh, uh, include like hardware security modules. Someone can consider paper as a uh, cold storage. Um, there is also custodial services. Custodial services is uh, like uh, there are some businesses where you can delegate key management or backup to them, these third parties. There is also distributed key and multi-signatures uh, using Samir. Uh, sharing, secret sharing, using multi-party computations, and obviously the, the new SIG approach where uh, you're having uh, three out of five, for example, signatures. So you de-risk a bit uh, the probability of your all of your key being uh, uh, compromised or lost. Um, there is also deterministic key generation. This is interesting because in practice, we're having one seed value, and with this seed value, uh, we can generate as many keys as we want. So the key management is easier now. Uh, again, you need to protect this master key. Uh, there is also social recovery where people are sharing their private keys with uh, family members. Like it's the same with amount of fan structures. Um, uh, nowadays, we're also using mnemonics and passwords. And with these mnemonics, we're deriving keys. I know there are a few people who are not, um, they do have um, like a hard backup but sometimes they don't know where it is and they oftentimes forget the, the mnemonics and uh, it's a frenzy situation uh, when this is happening. There is also biometrics recovery and there are also this kind of uh, transactions called ball transactions and it's a special type which enforces uh, the output to be locked for a period of time. And then during this time lock, the legitimate account owner has the option to abort uh, using a secondary recovery key. So, so there are two keys here and uh, the second one might be uh, only for recovery purposes. Um, I have a, a small gap here between uh, uh, the previous ones and the last two, paralysis proofs and donation uh, smart contracts. Um, the first one is related to, uh, it's the, I mean, these two are some, somehow reactive. The first one says that if you have an M out of N and eventually you cannot meet the threshold because not all of the actors required are online, there is a way to bypass it using SGX technology and uh, some other smart contract tricks. Uh, but it's focusing on M, on M out of N structures. And there is also the donation smart contract that was originated. I mean, I mean, some people at Ethereum uh, said that, oh, this uh, mistyped address is very common. Let's create a smart contract where people can donate money to people who with proof uh, actually uh, generated an address by mistake. Um, and there is also some solutions for mistyped addresses, right? Uh, now we have some blockchains that have a checksum in the address. So it's the probability of um, having one or two mistakes, I mean, uh, mistyped characters can result to a correct address with one out of some million uh, probability. And uh, now we're using QR codes. We're not copying paste uh, like alphanumeric strings. And there is uh, also, um, Another direction where some blockchains are having different scripts, different transactions for creating new addresses and sending money to the address. In Bitcoin, for example, if you send to a non-existing address, it will be created. In DM, for example, formerly known as Libra, um, there are two different transactions. If you try to send to a non-existing transaction money directly, it will fail. You have first to run a transaction to create the address and then uh, send money to it. Um, so, and here we are uh, with Kelp. If you're familiar with on-chain, off-chain transactions or atomic swaps, it might be slightly easier for you to understand how it works because there are some time locks here. 
Uh, but in practice, it's a three-phase uh, smart contract. It's, uh, we call it commit reveal talents. And um, you will see how it works. Uh, it's talents or claim, but you will see how it works. Uh, but first, you need to understand what's the secret sauce behind it. Uh, the key idea is, even if you think it's impossible by definition, because a, a recovering party doesn't have anything to convince the blockchain about being the owner of some locked uh, address, right? And however, we realize that there exists some information asymmetry on who is the first person who knows about the incident that happened. And this is usually the account owner. And by having this in your mind, you will realize, uh, I guess it will help you realize how our uh, smart contract works. Um, normally I would stop here and ask for questions after I explain a few bits of how the smart contract works. Now we're in offline situation due to pandemic, but uh, imagine uh, that you have someone who wants to claim uh, the funds from some address. Let's assume that this is an honest user. They lost their key. And what they do is they are creating a commitment over the claiming address, address C. And they say, oh, there is an address R, the receiving address, where the, the funds will go after a successful claim. And I'm using a nonce and I'm hashing all of it. And as you can understand, it's a commitment to two addresses and the nonce. The nonce is re required just to obfuscate things and not being able to create combinations and brute force it. So TX1 means transaction. Uh, so the first transaction of this uh, person who lost their key is to send a commitment uh, by paying some fee that they say, oh, I know of some transaction. Nobody knows yet what uh, some address, nobody knows yet what this address is for which the key has been lost. So you execute this and then you have to wait. You wait until the transaction is finalized. You have to ensure that nobody will front run you. Until now, nobody knows the address that you're referring to. So when you see that there are enough blocks on top of you and the transaction is finalized, validated on blockchain, um, it cannot uh, be reverted. Then you reveal the commitment. You reveal the pre-image of this hash. And by revealing, it means that you're just sending all of the contents of this hash. Address C, address R, claiming address, uh, receiving address, your nonce. And you also need to pay some fee. Uh, let's assume now that uh, someone is monitoring the network. Now everyone can see, oh, when you committed on this transaction, now you are revealing which transaction was this. And uh, you need to give now enough time for someone to challenge you. This is very important here because if this claimer was not a legitimate user, was a malicious user, they could just commit to a random address. Uh, if there was not revealed, they could go afterwards and claim the money. That's why we need to commit, wait until the commitment is there, then reveal it to avoid from running, then reveal it, and then you give enough time, it's T2, for people to challenge you. And if you were the legitimate user, nobody will challenge you. Because what is a challenge? A challenge is someone is signing with a private key. If I sign with a private key, some uh, kelp.challenge transaction or a regular transaction, it means that, oh, the key was not lost. So every claim you made until now, every reveal you made was false. That's why we have this fee here. People are paying a fee when they're revealing. And this fee might be proportional to the account balance to demotivate users for randomly committing to addresses uh, uh, that they lost their keys. And why this fee is important to be big enough? First, it demotivates people from randomly uh, committing. Secondly, if you challenge, you're getting this fee. So assuming this fee was 10% of the account you are trying to claim the money for, uh, after 10 accounts, if one of them challenges you, um, I mean, eventually in the long run, you're losing money. And if nobody is challenging you, then you can go with a third transaction and claim your money. So that's the idea. The idea is you commit first, nobody can see the address, which means that there is no, uh, I mean, they will try to front run you, but they don't know for what to front run you. Uh, then you reveal it when you see this transaction is finalized. Then you leave enough time for someone to challenge you. And if nobody challenges you, you can claim the address. Um, so that's the idea uh, behind our protocol. And we will explain a few details about these uh, parameters here. Um, if it wasn't for the commitment and someone was revealing uh, the address directly, we would have the problem of front running. So imagine if you go back here and there wasn't commit and transaction two was the first one, someone can, could just stop this transaction 
extract the, the data and create their own transaction TX prime, TX2 prime with their own receiving address, right? Uh, so the same address C, uh, but different receiving address. That's why we need the commit first to be there because the first commit wins. Um, and the second problem is random testing. Random testing means someone goes and commits to every transaction on chain. And we make this uh, like uh, non-profitable by introducing fees. You can do it, yes, but if this fee is proportional, I mean, you cannot do it uh, without any restriction. You have to be uh, very sophisticated on how you're doing uh, this type of attack. Um, so about T1, T2, T1, and T2, I explained before that T1 is the period between commit and reveal. We shouldn't have like a huge amount of time because we don't want people to commit, I mean, uh, very far in the past randomly. Uh, T2 is, uh, is very important because this is a challenging period. How much time do I have to challenge it? Imagine if a malicious user is doing this and I was like uh, on holidays, I need to have enough time. And usually uh, when we speak to people who want to implement this stuff, this might be in the range of months or even years. Uh, and fees, as I said before, in the commitment, because you still, the blockchain doesn't still know the address, cannot be that big, but it should be like big enough to disincentivize this type of transactions. But fee too, because now you know the address, might be proportional to the address C balance. And some uh, values that have been proposed is like 5, 10%, and it can even be customizable. Um, so considerations. Uh, this feature can be optional or default. Obviously, I mean, imagine if we go and apply it with an update in Bitcoin now, someone can go and claim Satoshi's account. So what can happen is it can be optional. I mean, if you want, when you're creating an address, you have a flag, oh, this is with help or this is without help support, or all of the new addresses can have it as a default feature. Uh, the second is we need wallet and ecos I mean, uh, the ecosystem in general to support it. If it's only you that is using it, obviously there is not enough mixing and people will know that it's your address if you're claiming something. Uh, something that was uh, uh, definitely proposed is that any transaction can actually work as a challenge. If you see any transaction from this private key, you uh, discard uh, and invalidate any existing reveals uh, for this particular address. The other thing is if you want to completely avoid all of the front running situation, you can add also an allow list. So there might be some entities on the blockchain, custodial entities, and um, you say that only these uh, addresses can actually claim uh, the funds from me in case I lose my key. And this creates a new ecosystem actually for custody. Previously, if you had a two out of three, if the other two and you had one key out of the three, if the other two entities were colluding, they would steal your money. Now, because of the delays, um, you can challenge them. If someone goes and do it, you can challenge them and then uh, the custodial service can help you, but only help you when you're not active. If you're active, uh, they cannot cheat on you. Uh, customizable parameters, of course. I mean, someone might say that T1 and T2 might be different in this blockchain because we're not handling a lot of money or uh, we believe it should be super user friendly uh, or we believe that everyone is monitoring the, the chain. And something very interesting is the fake transactions. If you want to avoid front running on your particular addresses, you might periodically send fake claims to your account. I mean, you know that you have your key, you can even challenge it. Um, uh, but people who will see the reveal on your account, they might try to front run you. And because you know the key, you will get their fee. So that's an interesting uh, uh, solution to uh, demotivate uh, front running. Wallet support, of course, what the wallet can do. The wallet should be able to monitor the chain for all of these kelp transactions. Obviously, they need actually to challenge transactions if they see a claim, uh, if they see, sorry, a commit and reveal. And um, they need to issue cover transactions optionally, as we said before, fake transactions. And obviously, if you lose your key, you need to be able to run all of the logic of kelp by committing, revealing, and then claiming. Uh, the attack vectors. The attack vectors is someone who can delay kelp transactions. So they see a commit, they stop it, and they stop it, and they stop it. They have so much power uh, until you uh, somehow they learn some information about you and they can commit before you, or they delay a reveal until T1 actually expires. 
and then your commitment will be expired, but because they've seen the reveal, they can do their own commitment. That's why T1 uh, must be carefully selected. There is also random testing, as we said before, someone, that's why you need a big fish here. Someone just goes and commits to every address in the world. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, property here that didn't exist before. It's an attack, it's a new threat uh, in, in our model where previously you, you can go and kill someone, but you cannot get their key. Now you can go and kill someone, you are the first who knows that there is no someone who can front run you. And if you know their address, probably you can, uh, uh, you can go and run it. There are some ways actually to avoid this. I mean, you never know if this guy had a backup and someone will challenge you from, from his or her family. And there is also side channel attacks, maybe some information exposed by IP or the committing address. Uh, you might uh, limit the, the range of what the receiving address might be. Even if you cannot see it, it's hidden under the hash. Uh, you might have a, a better uh, idea of what it is if you have knowledge of the network structure. Extensions. So some interesting extensions is, what if we made the commit transaction to be indistinguishable from a payment transaction? So now nobody knows if you are committing or if you are sending money to someone. And this might help on front running situations. Uh, the other is, if we're afraid of people tracking which addresses are sending to which addresses, just to reduce the space of what the address, uh, the claiming address is referring to, is you can issue some anonymous tokens like cashier check, I mean, as we have in the US, and then with this one, without having an account being able to commit. So you don't know, there is no correlation uh, on who initiated this transaction. There is also the dead man's key. Uh, the dead man's key is you have a secondary key. You don't protect it very well. I mean, you have it uh, in a paper. These dead man's keys can only be used if you lose your primary key. But if you lose it first, you always have the primary key to challenge. So uh, it's, a, it's a second uh, uh, like layer of protection. And eventually you also have uh, the decision in some blockchains like DM, you can still maintain the same address but rotate the key that corresponds to address. This is not possible in Ethereum. The, in Ethereum, the address and the key are tightly linked uh, or Bitcoin, but in DM, it is by design like this, which means sometimes you need to gain access to the same account, the same properties under the account, because your address might be in a QR code somewhere. You are a grocery store and you have a QR code. And even if you get the original funds, people will, will keep continue sending funds to the old address. So it's better if there is this functionality to gain access to the original account and not transfer the funds from this account. And that's all from my side. And thank you so much and uh, happy to answer any questions offline.